Thanks for listening to this latest Jiffy and Stubbsy podcast. I think, counting up quickly, I think it's the seventh that we have managed to get through. Uh, Jonathan so. Davis, uh, dual code rugby star, is in South Wales. I'm in South <coughs> London. Jiffy, good to talk to you. Our guest today, our very special guest, has a statue at Wembley. Have you got a statue at Wembley yet? No, no. <laughs> and I don't think I ever, I don't think I ever will. There's one worse when they're already. Billy Boston's there, I think. So I said, we're done. We're done. I got no chance. So yeah, Martin, Martin deserves this. He's, uh, you know, our guest, of course, is legend Martin O'Fire. Let me just read through some uh, Martin Rugby League tries for Witness Wigan, London Broncos, Salford, Eastern Suburbs in Australia, St George's Dragons, Rugby Union for Bedford and Wasps in Rugby Union, that is. Add on all the international tries. Martin, thank you for joining us. I've probably um, forgotten and left out a few, but we're delighted that you've joined us today. When Jiffy arrived a Witness, what were your first impressions? <laughs> My first impression was not this guy again, because even uh, <laughs> Jiffy has been a bone of contention with me throughout my uh, rugby career. It started back in 1986, playing in the Aber Iron Sevens. I mean, somebody has actually gone and put the programme. If you go to my Twitter, fi- my Twitter feed, I think you'll see someone's put all the programmes and the scores of all the rounds from this competition played in Aber Iron. I think in the semi-final, I scored four tries in that semi-final. <laughs> I think I scored... A hat trick in both first rounds of that competition, and Jonathan Davis somehow still managed to win man of the competition. <laughs> <laughs> He's not bitter. He's still not bitter. He's not bitter. <laughs> <laughs> and the best thing is a restaurant there called uh, oh, what's it called <laughs> Harbour Master, yeah. and there's the programs up. So every every time you got to go and uh, relieve yourself, there's a program there. It just reminds everyone who's man of the tournament. So, he, he but I do say, I do say. Ted Martin should have maybe yeah. won it because, but the diff- we beat them in the final because what yeah. we did was we thought, right, we watched this because it was only sat in between games. We sat in a double decker bus so we could watch the games. So we sat there and I thought, right, who's this bloke? I've never seen this bloke before and he was flying, right? Absolutely flying. I think he, I think he run around Agent Hadley, current Welsh winger, three times in the semi final. So we had a plan. I said, right, I'll, I'll go on the wing first, I'll stand on the outside, force him in. And then if he comes in, we've got to just twat him because <laughs> no one's going to send off the current Welsh host to in a Sam's tournament. It didn't send nobody. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we managed to win the final summer. But uh, oh, that's the first time I ever saw him. So uh, he, was, he was unbelievably quick. So, uh, and then I had the pleasure of playing with him. Yeah, so, Martin, I'll, I'll, what were your first impressions of Jiffy when he turned up a witness? The first impression I thought, oh, this is what a superstar looks like. This is what superstar oh, treatment yeah. is, what is like. This is paparazzi. I mean, Jiffy walked out. I remember this day. I'm on the pitch. Jiffy's only on the bench, right? First game. <laughs> and, like, he's walking out. I don't walk out. You know what I mean, not a soul, no fanfare. Jiffy walks out. All the photographers are around, around him. It's complete fanfare. He sits on the bench. I'm thinking, I'm going to have a good game today. I said, I think I ended up scoring against Salford. I scored five tries in this game against Salford. Jiffy got on. He touched the ball twice, okay? And the, all the headlines were about him. That's when I realised <laughs> what star power was. I mean, it was the future. Uh, you know, but, um, with, all, with all respect, you know, the guy, you know, he was a fantastic player. You know, you know I believe the last true, I don't want to like, you know, Give him two. No, don't don't to start, say, no. Don't start. I have nothing. to say, you know, I, I do take the, like to p- take the piss out of Jeff, but credit where credit's due, you know, he was the, the last true crown prince of fly And when he came to, to witness to play, you know, you really saw how, you know, fantastic footballer he was. A lot of people said that he wouldn't make it. He wasn't big enough or he wasn't this. So he couldn't do that. But, you know, I think he, he, showed, he showed everybody. And, uh, you know, he scored arguably the second greatest try ever <laughs> At Wembley Stadium. <laughs> even uh, though, better opposition, or gets better opposition. Yeah, even, even though it doesn't matter. That, <laughs> you know, I'm going to ask you, right, because I couldn't get over the attention that I had right, when I went yeah. there, because I, was, I suppose I was playing for Wales. Because yeah. you, you went there before me, what was it like when you, because you played like Roslyn Park, and then you went, you know, the Barbarians. Yeah. I just yeah. watched them on social media, tries in, in the Easter tour, when they played Swansea uh, and Cardiff. Friday and Saturday. So you scored, I think, maybe one or two hat-tricks that weekend. And that's yeah, when I I two we saw you. Yeah. So when you went, right, 
because you were, you know, at, at that stage, you were relatively unknown, and, and Dougie just grasped you out of watching the television and said, I'm yeah. going to get him. So what was it like for you going to, going to witness? Mate, it was, a, uh, it was a totally different to when you uh, went to uh, uh, witness. It was fanfare. I'm going to come and show you something. Here. This is just show you. These are the things that motivate me in my life, right? Excuse me, sir. I've kept it. So if you can see there, but that's, uh, that's uh, this is a newspaper from the day that I signed. It's from the Independent, Saturday the 6th of June, 1987. And that's me just down there. That's all I, that's all I got. That's <laughs> the only story I got. And I kept that. See, because I had something to prove. That's why I scored yeah. so many tries. Uh, there was no fanfare, you know, no one was expecting anything. Um, I, I was just breaking onto the scene. I scored a few tries in the Middlesex Sevens. I think I'd gone and played in Hong Kong and uh, ran around a few Aussies and uh, played against the All Blacks in the semi final. And that's when I sort of, sort of came to notoriety. But I, I was literally nobody when I signed. So it was just out, out of nowhere. And uh, everyone sort of thought, oh, you know, that's why a lot of people think that I just started scoring tries when I went to witness and I sort of came out of nowhere. But, you know, I'd been scoring tries from... You know, did was, did you, know, you play 18 of... games first then or did you just check you in? No, I didn't. The first ever game of rugby league that I ever saw live, I was playing in it. It was against Halifax. Didn't have a clue <laughs> what I was doing. There was this big guy called <laughs> Wolf George against me. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. I must admit, I think the, the first time I ever obviously used to watch rugby when I was at boarding school back in the day in, in the, like the, the early 80s and stuff and I used to think god this was a game of rugby league you'd never catch me playing a game like that it, it was mental <laughs> it was always be muddy and people you know, with noses across their faces and like that, as you all know and uh, it, playing rugby league was a, a, it's a crazy thought but I think it was um uh what was it the the Welsh uh, scrub off went from Cardiff Terry Holmes, Holmesy, that was it. Went, Holmesy, yeah, yeah, he went, he, and I saw it in the paper, and he got eighty-five grand. I was like, "Hang on a minute, mate!" So I thought this could be an option. <laughs> but obviously, I wanted, I, I wanted to play for England. That was, you know, yeah. what is is you wanted to play for Wales, you know. I was watching you know, some of my first heroes playing rugby, were all Welsh, you know, the Phil Bennett's and the Gareth Edwards, because I didn't know anything about rugby, and, and and the Welsh teams when I went to boarding school, they were the great side, that's great team of the seventies, and I've got to meet Phil Bennett, I've got a. A, a picture of me and Gareth Edwards on my wall as well. So those w were my icons, the guys I, I looked up to and, and the guys I, I, you know, I tried to be, even though I didn't have a, much of a sidestep, I used to work at it. But uh, yeah, that's, that's... So, so, so what was it like there when you, when you, when you had to go to places like oh, Halifax God. and then oh, Castle mate, Thun, mate. and then, you know, I, St. Helens, and all of a sudden you started oh, getting the name for yourself? It was a culture shock, mate. The more name for, I got for myself, the more that people wanted to beat me up. It was just like, the more tries I scored, the more that people disliked me. And, and they, <laughs> it was absolutely incredible. But witness, you know, it was, it was a special time that those, uh, you know, those years that we were there, those four years, I think, that uh, we, we played, well, it might have been only three with you, I think, that I played, but with Tatey as well, and Moriarty yeah. and John Devereaux. And, and all the boys, it was a golden time, obviously winning uh, against uh, the Canberra Raiders at Old Trafford, yeah. you know, so some, some memories, that iconic um, sporting and rugby league moments, you know, early on before we both moved off to, to, to foreign pastures. But I always remember yeah. playing, because I, before I think I, I played centre with you, you were my centre. I think Darren Wright used to be my centre, obviously. Yeah. And Wright, he was a great bloke, big, good, great hands. He'd go through the gap, he'd go to the fullback. He'd pass the ball. I'd be on the outside. You know what I mean? I'd, I think I scored a hundred and something tries in, <laughs> in, in nearly two seasons. And then, uh, then Jiffy comes along. Great player. Goes, <laughs> goes through the gap. I'm there waiting to get the ball. By about my second year now, they're thinking, Jimmy does a dummy. I get smacked in the face. <laughs> Jiffy goes under the sticks. I'm thinking, something's wrong here. This is not right. But then you decided he kept, you wanted... <laughs> he kept telling me that. I said, oh, he told Dougie, move him to full back. Yeah, I did, man. I think at one, at one stage of the season, which is very rare, because I was playing centre to him, I yeah. might have been just in front of him. He was. He was scoring, right? But you but scored like then, four or yeah. five tries at the beginning of the season in one game, but I only scored a hat-trick. I thought, mate, this is not, this is not on. <laughs> so he said, you got to move him. But you know, for me, right, you know, playing with Martin, if you break through and he got cover, he's always going to be there, right? Because... And also, when you look at Martin's tries, right, and people who score tries when he's playing for them, the first one to celebrate with the try scorer, say if I scored, Martin was right there, because if I didn't make it, he'd be there for the pass, right? So, but then it was, it was odd, because I saw, like, because he was such a massive kind of 
uh, play and a wing and scoring tries. When he went through, right, I saw I'd use him as a foil because <laughs> he was like a magnet. Every full back, just to say, I tackle Martin a fire, even if he didn't have the ball. <laughs> so I'd go, there you go, have that under the sticks. Easy as then. He shipped me off then because he was Dougie's favourite, Dougie Lotton's favourite. I was, I was shifted a full back then or something <laughs> like that, out the way. So, brilliant. I'm keen to ask the pair of you, when you made that move, when people talk about just how physical rugby league is, um, can you just explain to us about your thoughts on when you made that move and then just get into grips with the game out on the park? Oh, my bell's ringing. <laughs> Someone's coming to ring. I'm not, I'm Amazon. Not, I bet you it's Amazon parcel. Yeah. Jiffy, it's our, first, um, it's our first Amazon delivery on our it is, oh, no, it's, a, it it's the postman, it's the postman. I'm just doing a live podcast here. Okay, you just put it down there for me, mate. Yeah, thanks, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Mr. Do. Postman. It's live, it's live postcard. No, yeah, live, that, that. live, live. You can see it's live. You can cut that out if you want. No, no, absolutely <laughs> oh, not. It's all right, no. The missus has just come back. So when you, when you got there, Tim, yeah, what was yeah. it? You know, when, when did you realise you, you, you'd be good at it? Um, I say it was. Uh, I didn't score until my third game, um, but uh, I remember it was against uh, a run call. And so, but the, my first game against Halifax, I think Tony Myler just literally put the ball in my belly to get me over the line, and I dropped the ball. It just wasn't my day. But I used to think to myself, it's just like playing sevens, but there's 13 people on the pitch. You know, when you play tick and yeah. pass, you know. So I had a, a whole career of playing tick and pass at rugby union. So basically, playing rugby league for me was just like playing tick and pass. But you. Uh, you, you, there's tackling in it and there's a lot of violence in it so if you could, <laughs> if you could stay away from that you're all right and uh, you know I it soon became aware at Witness that I was the cash cow I think the year before I joined Witness they uh, they did quite had quite a good cut run but they nearly got relegated that season and then obviously I I come in uh that first year you know top the try scoring charts I think scored 50 odd tries uh we done the double and uh, so Everyone and I scored so many tries, so people didn't want me to get injured. So obviously, uh, Kurt Sorensen used to look after me. And if anyone like oh, yeah. uh, got too violent with me, um, like Les Boyd, who traced me around the pitch one day, oh. uh, then uh, Kurt used to look after me. So I, I've got to thank the, the witness forwards for looking after me. And yeah, I was nursed through that first season in rugby league. I didn't do much tackling. Um, if I, uh, you know, I, I always I think uh, scored more tries I think than I did tackles in the game. So. It, yeah, I just, I just literally stayed out of the way, did a lot of supporting, um, you know, just as, get as open as I could get and just score tries. That was my whole focus, was scoring tries. Because I think, I think Martin, you know, people say, oh, he's a finisher, he's a finisher. And I think he's the best finisher, you know, I've ever seen. And, uh, but what he was good at, he'd read the game very well. So a lot of the tries Martin scored was in, in midfield. So he would read the play and then someone last dish tag would pop it up and, and he'd score. So... You know, it was it was great. Witness were a great side in those days, and they had a great combination. You know, with Tony Myler and Kurt Sorens and Tatey, uh, the Hume boys, people like Martin O'Neill, Derek Pike. I remember he did a Derek Pike from Lee. He was the slowest prop ever, and then I remember he did a break against Lee, and then he was going through the middle, and me and Martin were either side of him, and we had to kind of run sideways to make sure that we didn't overrun him because he was that slow. But he was just he was a brilliant ball player, wasn't he? So right hands, and they were yeah. and they were tough as tough as old boots, all of them. So we it was a great combination because there's a lot of union boys. Like we had Martin from London, Mossy Colota from Tonga, Devro, me, Alan Tate, uh, Oz and Ozzy, um, Joe Grimmer, Brian Fire Marlow came, Brian McKebby came. So it was all different people, different all walks like and it was brilliant. So where where did where did the nickname, it's a brilliant nickname, where did Chariots come from? Who christened you Chariots? I know, it's, uh, it's so funny. Uh, that is uh, it's a bit of uh, one of these mythology sort of tales. Um, I recently got a, uh, a telephone call from the RFU, actually. Uh, it turns out that their, um, their uh, curator at the museum found footage of uh, me playing in the Middlesex Sevens before I went to uh, play rugby league. And the crowd, when I had the ball, was singing Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, because apparently the first time that had ever been sang at Twickenham was when Chris Oti uh, scored in, the, I think it was yeah. the 88 um, Six Nations game against, when he scored a hat-trick in the second half against, against Ireland. But the uh, RFU Museum had found this footage 
where I had uh, been playing and because uh, someone had said, oh yeah, we used to call him Charrots because his name was Mike the Fire. So I didn't even know. Was, like The first time I'd actually seen it was when I was playing rugby league. I think the Daily Mirror did, um, <coughs> did a, a big uh, uh, thing on me, uh, uh, story. And uh, yeah, and the, the headline was Charrots of Fire. And then they said, can we come and do a picture of you? So I said, okay then. So I dressed up in a Roman Centurion's uniform. They didn't have a chariot. <laughs> so they put As you do. As you do. <laughs> they put me in the back of a wheelbarrow and I've got the picture. I'm sure it's on my Instagram feed. It's a picture of me in a Roman Centurion's outfit in the Daily Mirror, front page of the or sports page, back page of the Daily Mirror in a, in a wheelbarrow. And so that's the first time I'd even heard the name Charrots, but apparently people had called me that before. It's not something that I'd really sort of adhered to because, you know, my nicknames were either Tinna or Jibber. Those are the only two nicknames I've ever had play in rugby league. I think it was uh, Tony Milo who started calling me Tinner, Tin Can Man, uh, Tin Martin. And, uh, and, yeah. and when I got to Wigan, my mates called me Jibber because I used to jibber all the hard work and just score tries. So those are the only <laughs> personal nicknames I had. But, but I call him Tin. Yeah, Tin. Yeah, that was my nickname yeah. at, at, at Witness. That came from Tony Myler. Uh, but yeah, Chariots is something that is more sort of I've gravitated to more for commercial purposes after I've retired and you know like uh, and, and Lots of times people call me Charrots. I was even on the game show, I think, Point of Celebrities uh, last year uh, of, on BBC. And there was another Martin, so they called me Chariots. <laughs> My nameplate was Chariots. So it has a, a nickname that, that has stuck, but it was, it was something more that was fostered on me rather than um, something that uh, I was called myself. Martin, when you were playing for Rosslyn Park, were you, were you living in southwest London? Because that's, that's where I'm based. I'm around the corner from Rosslyn Park. Oh, are you around the corner from Rosslyn Park? I'm actually, I'm in West London, in Ealing at the moment. Yeah. But no, I, I, I grew up in Hackney. Went to boarding school in uh, East Anglia, just outside of Ipswich. And then when I came to London, there was a guy called C Cedric Carr who uh, went to school with me, who played there. So I went down to play at Rosslyn Park. So I thought if I go to Wasp or I go to Harlequins, it might be too hard for me to get in the... Um, Get in the team. So again, I just rocked up at what at uh, Roslyn Park. No one knew who I was. Just rocked up. Uh, they put me in the fifths and scored five tries and just worked my way up. So there's, <laughs> it's, uh, there's a theme there throughout yeah. my life. <laughs> and he's posh. And he's posh. He's a posh kid as well. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say posh. Uh, but uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I'm a fighter and a survivor, constantly striving. And you know, it, it, it's uh, it's proved successful for me. But yeah, I used to have to travel from Hackney all the way to uh, Southwest London to, uh, to, to, to go to training and play games. And yeah, it was a tough two years, but a fruitful two years at, uh, at Rosin Park, two years, which I enjoyed. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, Dougie saw me and, uh, and took me to witness. Rosslyn Park now, they've got, they've got two massive advertising hoardings. Sure, you're seeing them on the main road now, which they can, they've been able to sort of sell off for loads of money and they've got a great pitch, great facilities now. So Rosslyn Park are a club, I would imagine, that are, are, are going to make great progress. Yeah, they're, they're doing very well. They are arch rivals because I actually live in Ealing. So um, due yeah. to the fact that my uh, children went to a faith school, so because of training times, I couldn't go and take them to Rosslyn Park. So Rosslyn Park at Ealing's like, arch rivals so uh yeah it doesn't go down too well when i go oh, didn't you used to play for us in park so i'm kind of like the enemy of <laughs> how did the move to wigan come about uh from witness uh obviously i had four great years at, at, at witness um i just felt like i'd done everything that i i could have done i felt that i wanted to move on to a, a, you know what i felt at the time were a bigger club witness were a big club but you know um we hadn't played in a, a Challenge Cup final in those four years. You know, we, yeah. I mean, we, we'd lost in two semi-finals, and um, yeah, just um, just the, the opportunity to go to go to onto the bigger stage, really. If I, if I'm I, honest, yeah. And I think with Wigan as well, I think you know, no disrespect to, to Wigan, but whoever played well against them in those days, they they, they had the money to buy. It. They were kind of professional before it went totally professional. So when you think, you know, they, they bought Ellery, they bought uh, Greg, Andy Gregory, they bought Andy Platt. Joe but Lydon. also Yeah, Joe Lydon. Mark, Mark so also, mm. Yeah, all of them. But also with, you know, the, the tough, hard-nosed Wigan lads who'd been brought through the system. So, they, you know, when, when I'm playing, you know, when Martin went, right, it was like, it was a blow, but they, witness needed the money anyway. And, you know, they, they well, you know, for, was it 440 grand? Yeah, yeah, that was it. That is, you know, for me, Ray, in soccer terms, that is like a hundred million pounds in 
in the transfer fee. You know, it's a rugby league when you compare it to football. No one has ever, ever come near to that. And, no, and, and they never have been. You know, no one, when you get the great Australians, they don't transfer anymore. But it was just, Witness said, right, OK, I'll be him. And that was the valley that Witness put him. And Wigan prepared to pay for it. So, but then train, when he went to you know, the Wigan, we were like, oh, yeah. Because we knew what he was like. Because we trained, you know, touch rugby against him. Couldn't get close to him. And then, say, somebody gets injured, um, you know, with the Wigan centre. I'm thinking, oh, that's nice. Dean Bell gets injured, New Zealand captain. <coughs> oh, who do they bring in? Gene Miles. <laughs> Maybe they're one of the greatest centres of all time. I'm like this. Oh, my God. Where is this going to end? You know, it was hard work trying to catch him. And then when Dean Miles inside of him, one of the, he was unbelievable. And that, that partnership was just, uh, you know, un- uncontainable, really. Martin, yeah. how would you describe that dressing room uh, at Wigan? It's a, such unparalleled success. And as you go through your, your teammates and the players that played for Wigan, just name after name after name. And it's like you just went to, it's like you lived at Wembley for the Challenge Cup final. It was just like, what an incredible chapter. It, it, was, uh, it, was, it was a great times at Wigan. It was uh, a lot of pressure because, you know, when you all got that £440,000 price tag on you, everywhere I went, you know, it was a waste of money, waste of money. Yeah. But, you know, as you, as you can tell from my interview, I, you know, I've gone through my life trying to prove myself and I think that's why I scored so many tries. So, so being in that pressure situation, it, it was nothing that I wasn't used to every day time I wanted to score anyway regardless of whether I was worth 440,000 or whether I was an unknown playing in the Aber Iron Sevens and no one knew who I was I was always wanted to score tries you know so it's something I've always done from 11 years old and I didn't even know what rugby was I think my first my t- steps on a rugby pitch I, I broke records so so to do it on that big stage I'd spent my whole life you know, trying to score in every game. So <laughs> trying to score in every game when you're worth 440,000 wasn't really that much of a stretch, but you were also in the right place with right players who had the right attitude, you know. Um, you know, it was good times at Witness and fun, but when you got into the Wigan dressing room, you know, it was a lot of competition with regard to, you know, training, you know, with likes of Phil Clark, Dennis Betts, and, you know, it, it was all, of, you know, they were, you know, at the forefront of being, you know, when it came to having the, the right physio, the right looking at your diet, yeah. looking at yeah. all those professional things, how you prepared for a game, uh, looking at everything around. All I knew at Witness is I just said, let's go out there, score tries. You know, I, I remember uh, in 92, after a semi-final, I think we played Bradford, I scored five tries in the semi-final outside Gerald Cordell. And uh, I remember in the, the team meeting the next day, um, John Moni said to me, Martin, apart from your five tries, what, what else did you do? And I thought he was having a joke and started laughing. And, but he wasn't, he was being serious. I just thought, what? You know, that's what they demanded yeah. of you. you know what I mean? and, uh, players like um, Jason Robinson, you know, who, who was um, head of his time and really changed how wingers played the game of rugby league and got in so much, involved in so much. And it really did expand my game at Wigan. And you see, as, as well as scoring tries, I was involved in lots more things. And, and uh, as I say, just added, added to my bow. And so you, I was in the right place uh, with, the, with the right number of players. But another interesting story about Dean Bell is that in, in the day I scored t- 10 tries, Dean Bell <laughs> scored a hat-trick and won man of the match. And I still remind him <laughs> of that to this day. <laughs> I tell you, you know, talking about change in those days, do you remember? Because we had a lot, you know, like I said, talking about the, you know, the chemistry in, um, in, in the change rooms and the <clears throat> determination and everything. Because we played touch rugby and everything before the game with Widnes. We did a lot yeah. of it. You know, yeah, and, I, and I still think young kids should play rugby, uh, touch rugby now because it's so structured. But do you remember that time, you know, because you were so quick and messed about all the time. Do you remember when <laughs> you and Andy Curry had a fight? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> own team, right? Our own team. And we had these little lockers. Yeah, we and did that. Andy, Andy Curry from Witness just couldn't take Tim taking the piss anymore. So he smashed him through the locker. <laughs> the locker's what he did, yeah. <laughs> I was sat there like this going, what is going on here? What is going on? Oh, I was just... But you have good laughs. You have good oh, yeah. laughs. It's bad, so. yeah. I- yeah, calm down. Everyone calm down. Everyone <laughs> calm down. Okay, let's go to the play now. Oh, it was, because that, that's how, you know, it is competition. And, uh, you know, yeah. it is. Um, and I remember when I got to witness the first thing that um, uh, Doggy told me is that, mine, come, you know, because no one knows who you are. You know, you want to make an impression. So I, I, I'd spent that whole summer at an athletics club. And I remember the first sprint when you used to get, them on, get you on the line. And you used to do 10 on the bang. You used to do sprints. You know, I just made sure that, bang. 
and you left everyone because that way you make an, an impression and everyone's like oh god this kid's you know what i mean this kid's got yeah. something and um, we did used to have a good competition with our 10 on the bangs on a, on a yeah. saturday morning before <laughs> to, to get the fastest time when we used to stand on the try line you had to run to the 22 and back again 10 times and it was like a little bit of a mini endurance yeah. sprint race and uh, oh, then, then we'd go, then we'd have uh, then we'd have uh, Chinese. Put on the fish and chip shop and then watch Football Focus. Oh, yeah. so that was it. <laughs> that was it, yeah. <laughs> I remember when we got to witness, like, the, like was, there was so far by the times that they used to have sherry in the changing room uh, at half time when it was really cold. They used to have a <laughs> sherry in the changing room, little cups. And I remember one day, Joe Grimmer put them all in one cup and drank it. And then he had the, <laughs> the most amazing second half performance. And everyone kept going, Joe's pissed! Joe's pissed! <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, thinking of that now in this modern world of sport, you know. So when you went to Wigan, it was total opposite, you know. They were fully focused, you know. They were all about the mental aspects of sport. Because I remember when we used to play Wigan, we was a little bit in awe of them. They used to come into the, the, uh, the, off the bus, walk into the change room. And if you knew one of the, or two of the players because you played with them in international football, they wouldn't even look at you. They wouldn't take you on because they were that focused. And things like, you know, like visualisation, mental preparation, you know, like at Wembley, if you look at the old videos of people at Wembley waving, but Wigan, they weren't. They just were focused. And that people thought that Wigan was their own ass, but they weren't. This was the precursor <coughs> of the mental aspect of sport. They were doing things and we were doing things which now sports psychiatrists give names to, but they didn't know what they, they didn't have a name back then. They yeah. were just, doing what they, what they were doing, being mentally focused, focusing on your job, not worrying about what everyone else does, not playing the occasion. People didn't know about things like that before Wigan. Yeah. You know? And they were sort of big on Dave Fever, who went on to become the physio at Man United and, and, and I think Blackburn. You know, they, the, the physical preparation is the stuff they used to do, rehab sessions and, 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 and work we used to do in swimming pools, all those things. So Wigan has, has been the leader. And then what Wigan did, you know, uh, with um, Rugby Union going down to play in the Middlesex Sevens and those matches with Bath, you know, the cross-code challenges, they really shaped yeah. you know, a lot of professional sport and how, um, you know, Rugby Union is today. Well, they even had, they even had, right? They even had the guy, the doctor who stitched them up, wasn't he a plastic surgeon? He's a plastic even surgeon. The, even the stitches were pretty. Were, pr were pretty. They used to give you B12 injection shots, you know, uh -huh. looking at diets. I remember when I <laughs> went to witness, I remember my first, one of my first games, and they, and they said to me, uh, yeah, we've got pre, I think we had a pre-match meal. I think it was before a cup game or something, or some important game, semi-final. And they said, you can have a pre-match meal. And I'd never had a pre-match meal before. And they said, what do you want? And I said, uh, what, you mean I can have anything I want? He said, yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, I have some cream cakes then. So I remember <laughs> having these cream cakes as pretty much meal. And I just was like, I could, it's almost like you can have anything you want. I just had cream cakes. I remember spewing up on the pitch at Central Park. <laughs> and I, I never did that again. <laughs> but I have to say, it's now 2020. But even when I started my media career, which is yeah. what, 40 years ago now, the attitude towards rugby league from rugby union absolutely came from the dark ages. Jiffy, I remember when I first met you and made a film about you moving from Wales. I remember making a film about you moving uh, from Wales to uh, eventually when you were making the decision to move to rugby league. And there was the suggestion that you had to sort of go and speak to the authorities, just the attitude. And I always, I always remember, do you remember Ray French, guys? Ray yeah. French, magnificent guy. I remember talking to Ray and Ray saying that he hoped in his lifetime there'd be more enlightened times. And thankfully, that made a lot of progress. But it was, it was shocking, the attitude from rugby union towards yeah. rugby league. Oh, yeah. It, it, was, it, was, it was, honestly, it, it, was, it was barbaric, the way they used to treat rugby union players who, if they only spoke to, I think there's a programme yeah. called the Code Breakers. Um, yeah, it's good. It's brilliant to watch. Code Breakers, it was on is, last night. Get yeah, it it's a fantastic, player. fantastic show about, you know, some of the, you know, the, you know, don't even going to span into the racism and, and whatever, but mm. just the way that, that players were treated. I remember I was persona non grata one time, and this was like 80, 87, you know, um, I think I didn't, you know, maybe I should have, looking back, maybe I should have informed the club that I was going to move. You know, it was the end of the season and I probably didn't handle it in the best way. But I, um, uh, yeah, I was persona non grata, you know, like I tried to speak to a couple of players who um, 
who I played with, you know, even they wouldn't even speak to me. And I know I've heard some stories about people down in Wales that even if you were seen speaking to a rugby league scout, that's it. You're banned, you know, <laughs> out of the club. Oh yeah, I've seen, I've seen uh, rugby league scouts being frog marched out of a rugby club on a Saturday afternoon after the game. Just a whisp of, he's a scout for St. Helens. You know, frog marched out. So, uh, but I, in there, what I also enjoyed was when, when you got to that level, Martin, when you were playing for Widnes and then when you were playing for, you know, well, any side you've played for, you know, when you have people like, uh, let's say, Alan Hunt and, and Des Drummond, you know, there's two players there. They try to knock your head off, didn't they, every game. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, that is, that's what, as a try scorer or, or as a player, and I'm sure you've experienced it yourself, Jiffy, I remember. Remember that game was at Canberra at Old Trafford uh, when he nearly oh, got yeah. decapitated yeah. scoring in the in the corner. I think there's a famous video on YouTube that's got a few hits of of one day at Nosley Road when Alan Hunt and Sonny Nickel <laughs> uh, just oh, Sonny Nicol, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, could, I couldn't even blame racism then. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, and I'm surprised because I I was you didn't you didn't have uh, were you. Were you Tempted to go to because I know you played some stints in Australia. You know I did as well. But did, but they must have offered you a longer term contract. Did, were you ever ever tempted to go? Yes, in '91 uh, when we went over. Yeah. Um, I think you was at Country Bankstown and, and I yeah. was at St George. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think we both had decent seasons that, that year. And uh, you know that's when I really knew sort of it was over for me at, at, at Witness, and I wanted a bigger stage. Uh, yes, they wanted to keep me, but I I knew back then that. If I'd gone off and played in Australia full time, that maybe you know I wouldn't have had the legacy that I've had. Uh, you yeah. know, if I stayed in England, so there was always that. The NRL yeah. was big, but it probably wasn't as big as it, it is now. And you know, the money that that they offered, you no, know, wasn't a par with what I got with, with what I'd get at Wigan. Whereas now, you know, it's it's five times more, ten times more, probably yeah. what you can earn in, in this competition. You've got to realise yeah. a lot of players from the NRL used to come over and play over here. You know, likes of Wally Lewis, G, um, you know, loads, loads. Brett of players. Kenny did, yeah. Brett Kenny Sterling. did, yeah. Peter Sterling. Malmeninga, Malmeninga um, came over Dale, the Yeah, Del Shearer came over, yeah. came over to us as well. Clear one of the Clear brothers came over. So you know, th there was because of the exchange rate and because of the power of the, the, the UK game back then, there, there was more money over here. So yeah, the lure wasn't as, as big. And you know, if I'd played my, all my career in um, Australia, probably you know, I wouldn't have had MBEs, I wouldn't have had statues, I wouldn't have been in Hall of Fames, I wouldn't have had to say, I wouldn't have had the legacy that I've had. Yeah. So I think I definitely made the, the, the right choice of staying over here. You know, I enjoyed the, uh, the two stints I had over there. I think, did you have two stints over there as well? Yeah, I had two on the Cowboys as well. Yeah, yeah Cowboys as well. As well so. Martin, we started off by talking about, we started off by talking about the statue of Wembley. It must, what is it like, I have to say, just like emotionally, to have a statue cast of you and at Wembley Stadium. I'm, I'm being serious now. That yeah, must yeah. be, that must be a massive thing to uh, just take on with making progress in the sport. Oh, rugby, rugby, and rugby league. Let's have a statue yeah. of yourself at Wembley Stadium. Wow. I, I've, uh, I've always said, you know, I've never won the lottery, but the, the day that I actually saw it unveiled, the emotions that I felt, I thought this is what it, what it must feel like to win the lottery. Because I just thought to myself, you know, if you, you know, if someone gave me the, the, the choice between a million pounds and that, you know, I would definitely take that because that is going to last forever. You know, you're a million pounds, you can earn, you can spend, you can you lose, whatever. But um, yeah. That, that the emotions I felt that day were were on a power with the the emotions I I, I probably felt the day that I um I scored that try at Wembley. In, Ar you know argu the try arguably the best try arguably, ever scored. Arguably, arguably. Uh, arguably. You, know, you know that try. You know when I, like you broke through. Okay, I, I, like, yeah. I, so people ask me all the time what, what happened when you saw when you when you things happening during the try. Right. Yeah. For me, it's like well, you just assess things very quickly. Yeah. When when you only run straight that because Alan Tate played yeah. with us right for a long time. I think he was quick. Tate, oh, he, he was, was quick. quick. Yeah. Did you know that when he showed you the outside, did you know I did, I've got it? Mate, you know, as you say, it helped that I mean, I'd played with Tatey yeah. uh, for a long time. I'd spent years doing 10 on the bangs with Tatey. I, yeah. knew, I knew he was quick. I knew that you were quick, but I knew he wasn't as quick as me. So if, I'm, if I have a race with Tatey and oh, Tatey, yeah. Tatey gives me a head start, I know he's not 
He's not, not big. Yeah, yeah, but he got his. He, he was good at getting his angles right. He was, he? So, yeah. so did you think, right? Hang on. When did you yeah. know you'd done it's it? Like, you know what I mean? It's like it's like it's like when you're watching uh, what's what's the Star Wars. You can have Jedi's, but you know. Obi Wan Kenobi <laughs> is on a different level, and that's what you know. It's, 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 there's levels. Okay. There's, there is levels to this, and like, there's no way that I would dare take Tatey on on the outside no. just like that because he's gonna have me in the yeah. corner. So I just, if you watch that try, I go in, I go out, yeah. I go in, I go yeah. out, and then I. It's like saying it's like basically having a race with somebody, and you say go. That's basically what it is. So it yeah. looks better. It is. I knew that he couldn't get. He couldn't get me because all it is. I always just say to people that a lot of times when you're running, that when you're ahead of somebody, even though they've got the ball, you know what I mean. You've still got to catch them. So it means you've got to run faster than they are running yeah. to catch them. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, and I, that's one thing I was always good was that people say that you know like people say oh well you were a good sprinter. I wasn't that fast, but my skill was I could run fast with the ball in hand. And yeah. We used, yeah. Used to practice that quite a lot, running sprinting with the ball. Because, yeah. and I always think to myself, whoever's running, that's why I used to stay relaxed as well. Because I think to myself, whoever's chasing me, they've got to run faster than me. Whereas te what Tater used to do, he used to give people the angle so they would have to run further than he used to run. Yeah. Well, I, you, you, don't, you don't take Tater on the outside there. You yeah. let him play your game. So you go in, that means he has to turn that way. If you look at the try I scored in 89, I think at Old Trafford against... Um, um, against New Zealand. And I think it's Gary Mercer. I do the same thing to Gary Mercer. And so, yeah, you went in like that, yeah. Yeah, so I'm thinking to myself, if I'm faster than you, and then I say go, let's have a race, I'm going to beat you, regardless of what I've got a ball in my hand. So, but I um, tell that to kids now. I tell that to the kids. So they say, oh, when he's trying to run around people, people are trying to run around on an arc. You've yeah. got to run straight at him first. You've got to hold him. And yeah. then you can then decide. Go. If he goes too early, you yeah. can do him on the inside. So on that point, right, you're talking about... what's what, I'm, so, so many tries, right? What's your best five tries? Oh, God. That, oh, mate. You know what, Jiffy? That is, that is, I've never been asked that question. I've always been asked, what's your favourite try you? or whatever? And what's your, but no one has ever asked me, because that, that's even tough. Because even, like, if it's yeah. one, then I always have to say the Wembley try, because... Yeah. What's the fight? So, like, I'll give, you, I'll give you... Obviously, the Wembley, the Wembley try is up there. Wembley one is one. Yeah. The second one is the one you scored in Wig, when we beat Wigan in the Championship. Yeah. Definitely. That was an amazing. I owe you. Well, that's you probably the best try ever because that's the try that got me to Wigan. Because as soon as I scored that one, yeah. Morris oh. went. When I spoke to Morris, we had a sort of yeah. uh, we was having dinner one time, and I said to Morris, try, yeah. "What's that?" He said, that's, "When that's you scored you that try, Wigan. yeah." He said, "That's when I knew we was getting rid of Mark Preston, and we had to get you." <laughs> yeah, because he went. He beats everyone in the middle and everything. So there, there's two, right? So yeah. Oh, I'm just trying to think. Oh, again, again. What? What? So I've got I to think of three one. more. We won't, we won't come to one you were... Uh, Obviously, I, the, I won't come to the one you dropped. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you dropped, when you lost, when you lost all of us over the winning money against New Zealand. I know, I know. Gary's... Three nil, we went 2-1. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but, uh, yeah, but yeah, Gary Schofield always reminds me of that, but I say, you do realise <laughs> I did score the winner to win the Test Series a week before, so that's that. Well, that's by the by. But I have to say, the one I scored at Old Trafford against New Zealand in yeah. 89, that's, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's... So that's an international one. So two more. Hmm. I'm going to have to say one, I think one maybe I scored for Wigan at... Um, uh, in the semi-final of the 92 uh, Challenge Cup final when I went outside... Gerald Cordell, I think the hat trick try oh, for that yeah. one. Yeah. Pretty, pretty special. And um, I always think to myself, with tries, it's kind of funny. If you score a great try and no one really, it's like, you know, when a tree falls over in the woods and no one's there, does it make a sound? Sometimes, you know, scoring a great try is about the, because I, I wrote a book a couple of years ago called 50 of the Best, which is about, I think, I'm sure you've got a try in there, Jiffy. It was about 50 <laughs> tries that I scored, or not I scored, sorry, 50 tries that, uh, you know, that I've seen scored or I've seen on TV or I've seen in real life and, you know, to dissect them because that's what I really used to do. People say, oh, yeah, he's fast, whatever. But I really was, it, along with the desire, it was really a skill with me and logging things, how I scored things, how you, things you did. It was, I used to, like, you don't probably realise this, but I used to try and learn to copy, to sidestep off you because, you know, people like you, obviously Phil Bennett, great sidestep. So I didn't have a natural sidestep, but I used to, like, I used to, like, try and create one because you could, run at somebody straight at them and size them. I couldn't do that. The only way I could do it was if I ran slightly to the left of them, slightly to the right of them and try and size. And that way I could get them across and then I, I could size yeah. them yeah. and I, I did it. So I think, so where am I? That's, uh, am I up to, where am I? Up to three or is it four? 
Four now. I think you've four. four. Martin, four. I thought you were going to say the try that you scored in the Abu Rabin sevens that should have won you man of the tournament. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say that, but, you know, no one's, it wasn't on TV. No one's seen it. <laughs> no one could go and see it. No one could turn to it. I like to always pick ones, at least on YouTube. It's so funny because without YouTube, you know, a lot of the things I've done in my life, people would say that I was lying. Like, yeah. I even made, when my kids, when they were like three, and I remember the first time I said to them and someone said, oh, daddy, you used to play rugby. And I said, yeah, I scored 10 tries in a game once. And they always say, no, you didn't. I can go to YouTube. Have a look at this. Have a look at this. <laughs> so uh, the yeah. last one, let's just say, I'm just trying to think, what would it be the last one? So I think so in, many. In, that's in the a bigger, reason. There's, yeah, not, uh, so many, but I'm just thinking, if I pick one that's in a game that no one can see, it's like... You scored it's... one against Australia, didn't you? You scored one good one against Australia down a touchline. You went outside Ettinghausen, I think. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 yeah, that was a, that was a pretty good. That was a pretty that was a pretty good try. The second the second test in uh, in Melbourne to, to win to, for a record victory. Yeah, yeah. So I'd say probably probably that one. Martin, I always remember when you look at the players in that Wigan team that have gone on to do great things. A lot of them in coaching. Yeah. Whenever I used to have to go and interview Sean Edwards, yeah, I don't know why. I was all scared stiff for Sean for whatever reason. <laughs> I don't know why, but I was all scared stiff for turning up. And now I've sort of watched great, great player. But now watching the way his coaching career is, 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 is developed, he's, he's just got it, hasn't he? Whatever it is, he's got it. Yeah. He, you know, uh, Sean was uh, a person that I've you know, got tremendous admiration for. Uh, our relationship has grown over the years. You know, we still keep in touch. We're still very close. He, 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 calls, he calls me all the time. I call him all the time. Uh, I think last week I, I did a podcast with Sky Sports and Sean was <laughs> involved with Phil Clark and getting me this cake. They made a cake. I don't know if you've seen it on social media, but um, Sky Sports sent me a cake in the shape of when it was in the shape of Wembley Stadium with me on yeah, top I've of seen it. it. Yeah, it was me on top of it, in my head in my hands. And uh, yeah, it was it was Sean that organizes that that and and, and sorted it all out. Uh, you know got tremendous admiration from him, even though when we first got together, he's such a strange character and everyone yeah. who's been in touch with Sean has probably got a, a Sean story. Uh, but I remember that uh, even before I'd even sort of really met him, I think I was doing uh, one of the Challenge Cup finals and I remember making a statement about Sean saying, I think he did a big tackle, I think it might have been in the 90 Cup final when I was at Wit Witness, the only way I could get to to uh, to Wembley was by doing the commentary for the, for the game. And ironically, then I went to Wigan and then Witness decided to get to Wembley in 93. <laughs> <laughs> but all the time yeah. I was at Witness, we never got to Wembley. Made a comment about Sean, and I think uh, Sean's uh, dad sent me a uh, letter in the, in, in the post, <laughs> which didn't, uh, wasn't the most complimentary. Uh, and then when we went to go on to tour with each other in Australia, he was my roommate. <laughs> we didn't really talk. And uh, I used to like to watch TV. And I remember once uh, I was rushed back to the room after a training session to, to put the TV on. I thought I'm having my rules so I could watch TV. Sean always wanted to fall asleep. And, I know. Uh, he, he pulled the, pl the plug out of the cable. So I, I got there and I, and I couldn't watch TV anyway. So that guy, he was smart. So he sought us in the room. Um, but I didn't realise as we got to know each other that, you know, that, and I got to know more about him, that he wanted to, to rest in between training sessions because he was giving it his all that much. If he had two sessions <laughs> in a day, he'd want to sleep. So, I'll, so as you get to know people and understand yeah. people, you realise, and, and even when Sean became a, a coach at, at, at Wasp, his first, when he first got his first sort of coaching gig, because, you know, Sean's strange character, not many people wanted to, to hire him, didn't really understand him. Uh, but then Nigel Melville gave him a chance. Then they were going through tough times whilst at the time. I just retired from rugby league. 2000, the start of 2002. Uh, they got some injuries. And, he, and then Sean says, why don't you come and play for us at Wasp? So I said, yeah, okay, okay, sure, I'll come and play for them. And uh, everyone was saying, no, he's a bit weird, he does, does this. But as soon as Wasp, <laughs> you know, as soon as they got on, they had to get on yeah. his level. As soon as they got on his level, then Wasp just went. They just took off, didn't they? Uh, yeah. A year after I left, you know, winning premierships, winning European Cups, then that relationship with Gatlin, you know, which went on to do what, yeah. this great stuff they I, did I with think, Wales. I think the one thing, isn't it? The one thing, the word that kind of describes him is intense. If you can cope Absolutely with his intensity intense. on intense everything he does, yeah, yeah, all the time. Not only when he's working, he's intense yeah. anyway, you know. I shared a room with him as well for three weeks, like, you know, and he's yeah. like, he's under the blankets half of that time, and he's having yeah. a cup of tea. 
having a cup he's, of tea. He's, he's weird, you know, but he's like he's intense. Own man. So you gotta like him. He's yeah. the own man who can only man I know who can have an argument with himself in the mirror to psych himself <laughs> up for games. I know another funny story about Sean is that we were playing in a TV game and Sean used to love to barrack people in TV games. Like you'd go back to some of the old footage and if somebody dropped the ball, he'd go up to them and be wagging the finger in their faces. And I said to Christian Linsky, if Sean makes a mistake today, <laughs> right, go up to him and, uh, and, and berate him. And uh, Sean made an error, but ended up just like, you know, batting the ball on the floor and giving himself uh, a good scene, a good, a good argument. And then what, well, Chris Radlinski was too scared. So back to your point, right? Even people in his own team, was, the youngsters who came into the team were too scared of Sean. He had this aura about him, you know. I remember watching Sean when I was, you know, I'm older than Sean. This is the funny thing. I'm older than Sean Edwards, okay, people don't realise, about, by about a year. But I used to watch Sean at school because I was like, I didn't leave school till I was 19. I was, I'd be at boarding school watching Sean in the 1985 Challenge Cup yeah. final. And uh, he's like 16 or 17 younger than me. <laughs> so I had him as like, and the guy is younger than me. And, you know, and uh, he helped me out so much. You know, it was just bits of, of, of information at crucial times in my career. Yeah. I, so I, rec cool. I recently put a, a post on social media, uh, uh, which was a newspaper article, which was on, I think it was either the day of the 1994 Challenge Cup final or the day before. Uh, and the, it's in the Daily Mirror. The Daily Mirror, it's talking about people who pump you up and put you down. I think the Daily Mirror was the first newspaper that called me Charrots and gave me a big spread. And they were the first newspaper, I think after me not playing so well in 93, after playing so well in 92 at Wigan. Um, on the morning or the eve of the, the final, they put a big story in the press, Alex Murphy, it says, oh, I'm like, F he's finished. That's I saw like, that, I saw that yesterday. <laughs> I've lost my bottle. Uh, this was a whole page, a big full in the paper, and I woke up to this, yeah. and, and that was great motivation for, for me. That I was the best of a bad bunch, I'd lost my bottle. <laughs> I was basically, no, I was crap, and this is what I went into, this is what was in my mind, I think, <clears throat> even when I went to the game, I had that in my, in my suit jacket, as you're doing the walk around Wembley, uh, you know, as you get interviewed, and I remember I, did, I stayed away from all the reporters. I was just focused, and I knew that on one sunny day that I was going to do something big in a big game. Obviously, I've scored 10 tries. I won the Lance Todd in 92, but I hadn't really done something which I believe would, you know, I would be happy with and would, would, would I felt, you know, cement my legacy or, or, gripped, or gripped that environment which I was in. And, and that's, I was always like that mentally. People say he was just fast, but there was always the things that were in my head. Sometimes I used to have to like try and turn it off because after a while there was so much in there, it got, it got too much. But that's really how, how, how I motivated myself. And waking up to that, it was just like... Uh, you know, it was, yeah. it, it was sure that got me to that because like in 93, I remember, I think I was, I was on tour with him somewhere and uh, things weren't going so well. And he just said to me, Martin, if it's not broken, don't fix it. And just simple <laughs> things like that. As, as you know, you're always yeah. trying to do this. You're always yeah. trying to do that to improve your game. We weren't in yeah. environments like, because I had uh, Sean, you know, he took me down to uh, have a chat with um, people like Lee Half, Penny and George North in the, uh, in the Six Nations uh, camp down at the Vale a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, he, cause he, I knew he was going to be a great coach. Okay. Cause he yeah. just gave me that bit of information that was, um, uh, that was just to the point. We didn't have what they had down at the Vale. So when I was talking to the likes of like George North uh, and Liam Williams, I was saying to him like, you've got everything around you now, you know, you've got hydrotherapy chambers, you know, you've got, you've got everything that you need, but we didn't have that. We had to go and find that for ourselves. And sometimes yeah. when you went to try and find that, you 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 get something and, and it would be wrong. Like, you know, I tried to put on too much weight, I lost a bit of speed. And he said, Look, mine, so just do you. Just, and, and and what he said was, yeah. run hard, run hard. So, you know, <laughs> and with people like Jason Robinson in the team, and that's what Jason did, and we had Vyinga Tugamala, and they thought they were getting rid of people like me. So that's basically what I did. And if you look at that try, yeah. You know, it's not something that I normally did. It wasn't my game. If you look at most of the tries that I score, they're either on the left wing, on the right wing, or picking somebody else doing the hard yards, or, you know, on the back of something, something, and then I, I add my bit to it. But if you look at that try, you know, that is, I just literally, 
I'm just doing a hit. I'm doing a Jason Robertson, and then I get into the open field, and then that's, up, when, yeah. and that's when yeah. I take over. And that's the so I, and that was just basically Sean saying to me, Ron, if Sean hadn't said that to me, I don't think I would have scored that try in nine four. And think people like Alex Murphy were just jumping on the bandwagon of Martin. Had, yeah. You know, he had he, yeah. he had such a great night to play with Gene Miles. And then ninety three, he wasn't doing so great. Had had a re, had a real lows. Had a shoulder uh, reconstruction. So he, he really is kind of like you know when you're having a bit of a, a bad time, everyone jumps bad on. Time, yeah. And then you need the people around you. That's what you know. I'm watching this. <laughs> that's a strength of character, though. Yeah, that's when you need your strength of character. The, the people real around people you. around you. you yeah. know, I, I'm loving watching things like this. Um, documentary that I don't know if you've seen it on now called The, the Last Dance with Michael yeah. Jordan. Don't with, tell me what happened. I got two to watch. Don't tell you watched, me what's I won't tell you what happened, but just everything that, oh, you're yeah, going, everything that he's going through and, and you mirror it in some, in some of the things that have gone and having the right people around you, having that small group, people that you trust. And Sean was someone that I trusted. And, you know, that's why I relate. And that's why, because I say, we, we had a bit of a rocky in, introduction to each other. But yeah. as soon as we trusted each other, then yeah. it showed on the pitch, you know, and that just... You play with it's amazing, and it's it's amazing, Mark. That you know, when you look at that the documentary, a lot of people are saying, "Oh, yeah, you know, he's a bully and all this." We spoke this before. Right? It's not. It's different in a sport. You have to be different. Be, you have yeah, to be because you're driven, you're and driven. You've got, you can't be sensitive. You can't be sensitive. For the good and you need literature. everyone to be on your. When I went to Wigan, yeah. you know, everyone was on that. And if you didn't do it. You were you were you were lambasted in meetings. You were ridiculed. Yeah. You whatever they had to do to get you to perform, they were going to do. There was not none of this modern thing about you know in modern things that oh it's bullying or it's that it was that you either got on board or you were out the door. There was no room for for the niceties and the or sensitivities a, or a medal, that you have today. A medal for everyone. You oh you come up, your kids come up from school and you go oh what you go, oh you're a lovely medal. What do you come twenty fifth? Oh you know, well done. And, well and, done. I, and, and, and I liken and I liken um. Wigan's run in the Challenge Cup, you know, for eight years to, um, uh, you know, to, to what, what Jordan did, you know, uh, yeah. six championships in eight seasons. Yeah. But then I also, you know, the thing about you had, when you had to take that year off, you know, but I knew that, that, that it was going to come to it, you know, it's great, but, you yeah. know, we had our last dance yeah. in 95, yeah. you know what I mean? And then, but yeah. I knew it was going to come to an end because you can't, you can hold your breath and break records, but you have to breathe sometime. And yeah. that's why for me, you know, and, and the Wigan, no, we had to breathe and that's why yeah. it all, all fell apart. You've got me onto a different subject now by talking about that, Martin. Uh, Garth Crooks is a really close mate yeah. of mine and talking to Garth about retiring from elite sports. And Crooks used to say to me, you know, it's going to happen and you put it to the back of your mind and because you've got to get used to life after this incredible buzz yeah i mean uh, people can uh paraphrase it in different ways but it's the same thing it's like uh you know <laughs> it's something they don't write that on the tin you know what i mean they write about all the highs they don't write about the lows or the injuries the pain that you're gonna suffer it is all worth it in the end they don't you know people now they talk about it, but back then they didn't really talk about, you know, you've got the rest of your life after, because it's all right very well, the likes of, you know, Sean Edwards and, uh, and, and um, you know, all, a lot of other top players who have played with injuries in, in big, big games, like, uh, you know, Sam Burgess, you know, famously yeah. played with a broken um, uh, cheekbone, you know, in their grand final in Australia. But you've got to realise that when, you're, uh, when you retire, you've got to take all those injuries and... And, and all the lows and, 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 and all the journeys, you know, into your, into your afterlife. And, you know, that's not what is shown to a lot of sportsmen. We, we all talk about what we want to achieve and all the highs. But, yeah, there is a, another side to it. You can call it a car crash. You can call it, you know, a lot of sportsmen have, have had troubles with, with, with the, you know, drugs and alcohol, the, the great work that uh, the, right, the likes of Terry Adams, you know, Tony Adams is, is doing. Yeah, you know, chance. Sporting chance, yeah. you know, there's a, that's the dark side of sport, which a lot of people don't talk about, and, and what you need to do to get because everyone just sees, oh, yeah, they're fantastic, they win. But you know, when you peel away, you know, <laughs> the, the top layer and you delve in and you see what the likes of Michael Jordan has to do, yeah. you know, to get people, okay. and this is all without, without, a, uh, without a book, there's no uh, manual yeah. to do this. this uh, everything that I've done is without a manual, everything that Michael Jordan's done is without a manual. And so, and it's easy for people on the sidelines to sit by and say, Oh, he wasn't very nice. So, yeah. like, no, I think you know what it is as well, Mark. It's like you know, it's mental awareness week this week, right? And yeah. um, I think. When you mentioned the car crash, the difference is, I think, those 
who know the car crash is coming, but even though you know it's coming, you can you can prepare for it. So uh, you put your safety belt on and you, you make sure the car yeah. and, the, yeah. and the bag is uh, is there. So, but that's the thing. But when if you prepare for it, you're in a better position. That then yeah. and and you know what you're going to do because once your sport in career is finished, there is no other sector of business that can replicate the adrenaline you go through as a sportsman. And I, and it shows this. The reason sports is all about emotion and about crowds at the moment. You know, can we play without crowds? Can we play? It's, it needs the crowd. But also, there's so many reruns of different games now, right, of every sport. It's not the same. Because the reason we watch sport is we don't know the result. You know a film, what's going to happen in a film. You prepare the yeah. scenes. Yeah. When you go to Broadway show, you know what's going to happen. The reason sport is so unique is because you can prepare as much as you want. Once that yeah. whistle goes for the first time, no one knows what's going to happen. And that's why it's important that you prepare for the afterlife of sport. Uh, yes. Time's, you... Time is against us. Martin, what are you doing right now? I know you've been DJing for many, many years, but I'm sure you've got lots of other interests as well going on. Uh, how, what is, what is yeah, life my, my... Like right now? You know, life is all about passion. I was passionate about my sport. You know, I, I'm passionate about music, you know, DJ and TV. But, you know, uh, what I'm really into at the moment is sustainability and uh, electric vehicles. I, I'm what is known as the early adopter. I've been driving electric vehicles for about three years now. And the opportunity uh, about 18 months ago um, arose to uh, invest and, and work for an electric vehicle charging infrastructure structure company um you know a sustainability something that's close to me I, I you know i do want the planet to be in a decent state for when my kids and my kids kids yeah. are, uh, uh you know are adults and 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 if we can do something uh you know to help the planet to, and to help the air that we breathe you know the number of, of people dying from uh you know uh bad air, pollution, uh, you know, yeah. year, year on year, and what it, the cost of it, each car to the national health, you know, to, to move over to electric vehicles is, is a no-brainer. So yeah. when the opportunity came to invest in Connected Curb and Connected Curb, they have a solution for people without driveways. So uh, I have a driveway, I can get a government grant, I can put a charger on my drive, and as long as I don't go beyond the range of my vehicle, then I'm I'm sweet, you know, and and and, and the cost. Is that why you haven't come to see me? Pardon? <laughs> Is that why you haven't come to see me? <laughs> Let me tell you, Jiffy. Coming to see, I came to see you on your. Uh, this is your life. Imagine this, oh, right? I, I go all the way to Wales, BBC. This is your life for Jonathan Davis. They give it the big build up, and I walk through the smoke, and then is your great fan. You know, he's first. He says to me, "What are you doing here?" I'm like, mate, I've just travelled all the way down to appear on This Is Your Life and all you can say to me is, what are you doing? But you know, it's Martin, like, what happens you know, if you, what happens, Martin? Demons. Martin, what happens if you have to leave your car on the road? Is there a, is there a yeah. way around that? Uh, that's what I'm saying. So my, um, my, my company, Connected Curb, we put um, uh, charges on street. So for people who don't have driveways can experience the same ease and convenience that I do. But obviously, if we, a mass roll, rollout of those would be, yeah. would clutter up our streets and wouldn't work. So what we do is we put power and data into the curb. So basically, we separate the plug from the charger, we put the charger submerged into the ground, and then we just enable existing street furniture so there's not a clutter on the street. And so this is a unique right. solution, which we obviously are, are, are using with a lot of uh, council. So we, we, we do a lot of local authorities. So my first deal, ironically as well, my first deal was in Holton, which you may or may not know is witness. So my old, um, <laughs> so I'm involved in um, uh, business development, you know, slash sales, slash brand ambassador. So I'm basically going out beating the drum, uh, get, telling the story, getting people to know about our kit. And uh, I went up, up to Witness to do, um, uh, Jiffy didn't attend, he never attends the Witness dues. But uh, I was inducted into the Hall of Fame last year with Kurt Sorensen. And so got talking to- I was working. You was working, yeah, <laughs> I was working. So I got talking to a few of the directors who introduced me to some people from the council. So uh, Holton Borough Council was our first deployment. And um, yeah, it's a long time in the making. But yeah, as we speak during lockdown, those charges, are getting uh, 
installed as we speak and will be ready for the people of witness in a week or two two's time so yeah time, that's, that's what time, is, against, time is against yeah. the skies is uh, is doing that strictly stuff very nervous martin when you're on strictly come dancing um yeah the, um, the reality tv stuff I've had, a, I've had a whole career of reality tv which has probably helped keep my brand and my tries alive because every time i appear on a reality tv show like splash or strictly come dancing or the weakest link. Yeah, they always uh, roll out my tries. So a lot of people have, have seen my tries, but have never seen me play in, in the flesh. So, someone That's said when Martin on Splash, you know when he was on Splash, someone said, like <laughs> some of the opposition fans said, the only way, the best way to improve the programme Splash is, is to take the water out of the pool. <laughs> hey, Jiffy, Jiffy, I can see you on Strictly, Jiffy. you got no yeah. chance. Oh, you come got on, no Jiffy, chance. that'd be No, funny, my man, knees are shot. Low. My knees are shot. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a shot. I might go and say I'm a celebrity, but I don't know. <laughs> no, so I don't do it anymore, but I'd love to do Big Brother. That's I've, I've done Big oh, Brother, I did, so. I, but probably one of the biggest shows I've not done um, is um, is uh, Big Brother, yeah. yeah. Jiffy, so I, 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 hey, you'd love it, mate. We'd just be talking around, talking nonsense. I could talk all day. <laughs> yeah, but the word, I know that. But the worrying thing, you'd have, some, you'd have someone bell ending there. You'd have to try and knock him out and be thrown off then. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah J Jiffy in the jungle would be worth saying. Martin, <laughs> thank you very much for talking to us. Uh, now, that hour has flown by. You could, we could do another hour and a half for sure. Yeah. But uh, thank you very, very much for joining us today. We do appreciate it. Look forward to seeing everyone soon. Jiffy, Martin, stay yeah. safe, everybody. Look Take out for yourself. Take care, uh, care the NHS. Good to see yeah, you all. Good to you all. will follow. Cheers, guys. Look after yourself. Pleasure. Take care, Art. Take care, boys. And thanks for listening to Jiffy and Stubbsy. Hope you'll join us again. Please hit the subscribe button.